Candyman, 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 Candyman. Let's talk about Candyman. So I want to talk today about Candyman, the 1992 film, and the 2021 reboot, also called Candyman. I do these kinds of unscripted ramble videos as regular updates for my patrons, and patrons get to vote on what the topic will be, and then I, I talk about something, and then I just give an update as well about what's going on with me. Um, update about what's going on with me, uh, I was going to release a video about The Forgotten City this month, I didn't, it's postponed, I got a bit overwhelmed, but I was already planning to do a Halloween special where I talk about Candyman, because I love Halloween, and I want to do a Halloween special, and uh, I had no other ideas about it, but I did see Candyman, <laughs> so let's talk about it. <laughs> If you like this kind of content, please let me know, because it will be very helpful to know uh, that I can do this if there are other times when I really uh, want to talk about something, but I don't want to have to write a whole essay and film it and edit it and all of this. Okay, so I need to do a synopsis of both films, but I'll try and keep it fairly brief. Um, first, the original 1992 Candyman, for those who haven't seen it or don't remember. 1992 Candyman centers around Helen Lyle, a white semiotics student at Chicago University. Uh, what is semiotics? Well, semiotics is a bit like what I do in Monster Man, or people might be familiar with Joseph Campbell's uh, The Monomyth. It's about how meaning is communicated and how meaning evolves over time. For the purposes of this discussion, it's best to think about it in relation to culture and storytelling, although it's a broader field than that. In particular, Helen Lyle is researching the black community of Chicago and the Candyman myth, which is like a very, like an urban legend horror story. Uh, it's a very typical, like, hook-handed serial killer. He's like full of bees and stuff as well. The original myth is that this 1800s era black man who's a son of a slave became a well-known painter, fell in love with a white woman, and then her father had him lynched. He was horrifically murdered, he had his hand cut off and replaced with a hook, he was covered in honeycomb, I think, and then he got stung up by the bees, and that's why he's full of bees. Um, and it, now, if you say his, if you say Candyman five times while looking in the mirror, Candyman will appear. Helen, actually, at the start of the film, is showing her friend Bernadette how her apartment is identical to the apartments on the other side of a new railway track. Basically, like, uh, a new, you know, this railway was put in and uh, uh, the side that she's on has been gentrified since, and the other side is the project where she's going to be going and doing her research, but they're still physically the same, which is just like a fun, you know, uh, speaking of semiotics and how meaning is communicated, uh, reflection, haha, a, a mirror, if you will. <laughs> Uh, she literally opens her, like, bathroom, like, takes her bathroom cabinet mirror off the wall to reveal a hole through to, like, the unoccupied apartment uh, on the other side. And uh, her plan is that she's going to go to this, uh, this, this building on the other side. It's literally you know, the, the bad side of the tracks, like, very literally. Uh, a lot of this is, like, kind of on the nose. But it's quite interesting how the movie ends up being at once quite on the nose and then also, like, not explicitly showing what it's doing for a lot of the way through. In fact, I came away from the first viewing of Candyman 1992, like, quite confused as to what it was trying to get at and what it was trying to do, and um, only got, like, only for sure got it a little bit before watching Candyman 2021, and then, like... Stuff that happens in Candyman 2021 confirms what it's about. We'll get to all of this. Her plan is to go to this building in the project, go in to, um, go through an unoccupied apartment into an apartment that's, like, abandoned because it's a crime scene uh, where there were these Candyman killings. There's this urban legend of, like I say, the, the Candyman killer coming back and, and, and killing people. Helen's thesis is that the black community project, um, it, like, project emotions related to their suffering and hardship onto the narrative of Candyman. An interesting thing about the story is that it's actually adapted from a short story by Clive Barker called The Forbidden, which was about class in uh, Liverpool. This is something that kind of happens fairly often, where the most open and acknowledged struggle 
in uh, society in the UK is classism and class struggle, whereas the most open and acknowledged struggle in American society is racism. And so often you get these kinds of adaptations where to make it make sense to an American audience, uh, it changes from being about class to being about race. Sometimes it goes the other way, but it's mostly um, this way around uh, English source material, like <clears throat> British source material uh, going through Hollywood. Anyway, um, on with the story. <laughs> it's a very easily understandable thesis, what Helen's getting at, that people project their feelings onto this onto this story. Um, it, it makes a lot of sense. People can, you can see why that is. But there's a little bit more going on with Helen in general. And in particular, it's that she has maybe not a very healthy relationship to the black community. Um, to put it simply, she's quite fetishistic of them. When she goes to interview a woman called Anne-Marie, she's looking at Anne-Marie's baby and it's clear that she wants to, like, she wishes to, like, take the baby away from, uh, away from the black neighborhood, away from her mother, away from all of this. And she's imagining, like, giving the baby a better life and being this, this white hero. Overall, like, it keeps coming back that she basically wishes that she could be the white savior. Um, anyway, uh, while she's going around doing interviews and taking pictures, a uh, a guy with uh, several friends come and attack her with um, with a hook. Like he says, like you're looking for Candyman. You found him. Like then when she's leaving the hospital later, she starts hearing this voice, and it's the voice of the Candyman, like the spirit, the legend, the 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 urban myth, and he appears to her. And what's kind of interesting is that. He's dressed in, like, a long fur coat, which, like, you know, he's, I mean, he's meant to be a famous painter, so, like, like, maybe. But, like, there's this very clear thing going on from the first scene where Candyman appears, where he's, he is her fantasy. He is her uh, idea of a seductive black man, and he's almost presented like a pimp. Um, and this idea of him using some kind of hypnotic magic to seduce the white woman is is very clearly like tied into her fantasy and her unhealthy relationship to the black community. But as I said, like all of this is like screamingly obvious, and at the same time, the movie never actually like fully snaps out and shows you like she's just imagining all of this she's unhinged like she's 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 in this fantasy like the movie presents you what she is imagining going on so he abducts her she wakes up in uh, Anne Marie's apartment the woman she was interviewing before and she's covered in blood the dog has been beheaded the baby is missing Anne Marie attacks her because th there's this stranger sh showing up in my apartment and there's blood everywhere it's probably her, um, <laughs> and from there things kind of like spiral outwards with like more murders being done, done by Candyman, you know, and Helen getting blamed for Candyman's murders, <laughs> um, and eventually um, Helen figures out where Candyman put the baby, and uh, um, the baby is inside a big bonfire that the neighborhood are doing to just like burn up some trash. And Helen goes in and rescues the baby bravely from the bonfire. And then she dies after her heroic act. And then um, because she was so beloved for saving the baby, the whole black community come to her funeral. <laughs> and um, and they, they spray paint a mural. Like there's a mural of Candyman in, in the abandoned um, crime scene apartment. And they spray paint over it. And now it's... It's Helen, and she's she's literally depicted like as a saint. And then the, the final scene of the movie has her come back as a ghost and murder her shitty boyfriend who cheated on her. Um, <laughs> and so it's all just like um, when I'm describing it like this, and and this is part of what made me realize it, it's just like when you describe it, it's really obvious what they're going for. Like it's really obvious that this is all her fantasy. But the movie doesn't, um, I, I want to say wink at you, but it would be unfair to say that. Like, it, it does wink at you, and it does constantly question her sanity and her grip on reality. But it doesn't, as I say, like, snap out of it at any point and just show, like, her doing a murder with a hook or something.
So what's kind of interesting is that her research is into uh, semiotics, folklore, culture, urban legends, and she has this unhealthy fetishistic relationship to the black community, and then she ends up doing all these murders, imagining herself as this white savior, but in particular imagining herself seduced by this spirit of the black community, and all of it is her being utterly lost in the world of semiotics. She's utterly lost in the world of signs and symbols and how meaning is communicated, and she is ignoring reality. She she completely becomes detached from reality in doing this, and I think to some degree the film is is saying a lot about the people who study culture in this in this regard. Um, you, you maybe see why this is uh, particularly interesting to me then, <laughs> because um, it's it's saying that like when you study uh, culture, you study stories in this way about and and you attribute them with having power. Like, I mean. A fetish coming from the, the, the Catholic tradition is literally a, an object which is uh, symbolic of holy power, and that's the metaphor that Marx used when he was describing like commodity fetishism, and then that's the euphemism people have used when they're talking about paraphilia, uh, like sexual fetishes. And so, in a sense, when people are um, talking about culture and talking about stories from minoritized communities in this way, they're and they attribute power to storytelling in that regard, like, they are very literally fetishizing storytelling, fetishizing culture, and fetishizing those minor minoritized communities. And that's what we see in the story of Helen Lyle, is, is, is a classic story of fetishism where, like, no, she doesn't have the power herself to change really anyone's material uh, situations, I mean, except for her... Uh, evident fantasy of like adopting a black baby and 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 ra you know, raising them in relative privilege like outside of that there's not much she can actually do for these people but she wants to imagine a fantasy in which she can and i think that's the true horror in the original candy man is a, is something that's quite comparable to um lovecraftian horror in a way like the absolute infinitesimal um, tininess of the individual, just how, how tiny she is and how, like, her privilege that separates her from this community uh, doesn't actually give her the power to change anything or do anything. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just very, like, isolating, alienating kind of look at what's going on there. I think all of that's very interesting, solid movie, um, well, well worth a watch. And um, there were a couple of sequels. It was it was one of the you know '90s horror franchises that took off, and it, it gets a series and all of this stuff. But uh, what's particularly interesting about the 2021 reboot is that, uh, as with again many cases with horror, like they're choosing to go back to the original and really deliberately interrogate the original and be in conversation with it. So. Candyman 2021 is more of a sequel to the first film more than anything else. Um, and I mean, the fact that it's just called Candyman might be a bit of evidence towards that. So the new Candyman, maybe that's the easiest way for me to refer to this. The new Candyman um, was produced by Jordan Peele. It was actually co-written by Jordan Peele. But when people have been calling it a new Jordan Peele film, uh, it isn't exactly. I mean, it was it was it was co-written by him, it was produced by him, but it was directed and written uh, and also produced by Nia da Costa. And although I haven't seen anything else by Nia da Costa, uh, if this is a mark of like her filmmaking abilities, uh, she's someone ex to extremely watch out for. Uh, not just in the writing of it, not just in the the adaptation of this franchise into something really really interesting uh, and and with a really complex interesting statement to it, but it's also beautifully shot. It's it's so well constructed and well put together, like thematically the character interplay. There's so much about it that is a really like neatly fit together product. In particular, when I was watching the title sequence, and they have these these shots in the title sequence that are like looking up. Um, at uh, Chicago tower blocks in the like in heavy fog, 
and it's just like trailing like you know you you must be in a car driving along but it's looking up at them and so you can't really understand what you're looking at because it looks like you're you can't tell if you're looking up or looking down for ages and these, there are these really long long unbroken trailing shots and it looks like am i looking down on these buildings and and there's fog covering the streets no i must be looking up at them and it's just a really bizarre perspective change um and and when those shots came up of the title sequence i was like okay this is going to be a very cool movie <laughs> so i mean even just visually a great movie to watch but um i hope what we can get into here is how the movie is saying something really interesting and um, where it's kind of a meditation on a lot of the same stuff as the original uh, while doing exactly what it kind of sets out to do. It, it, it is in conversation with the original. The New Candyman is about Anthony McCoy, played by Yahya Abdul-Mateen II, who is going to be uh, the new Morpheus in the, the Matrix sequel that's coming out, and I'm unbelievably excited. Anyway, he's very good. <laughs> uh, and he plays Anthony McCoy, who is a, a middle-class black artist in Chicago. There's an interesting change here, right? In that we had this British story that was about class, and it got adapted into this story where a white person is looking at black culture. And although it's extremely about class, I mean, um, Helen's friend Bernadette is also black, and she's a middle class black woman. And she's incredibly uncomfortable going to the projects in the original Candyman. It's a noticeable thing. Class is a very prominent thing in the original Candyman too. But race is kind of the primary thing. So you had the original story about class, it was adapted into this story about race. And then with the new Candyman, Anthony is a middle class guy, and class becomes even more prominent again. It's kind of an internal conversation about uh, black culture in America between middle class black, black people and working class black people. But we'll get into it. <laughs> so, Anthony is an artist, and he's frankly not a very good one. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's subjective. Art is obviously to your subjective taste, but it is a uh, noticeable thing that he hasn't produced new art in a long time. He's been this dry spell and can't like crack into anything new. And then you see some of his old art and how he's just repeating the same thing over and over again. And the same thing he's repeating over and over again is uh, a black man's uh, torso area, sort of chin to waistline, uh, straightening, a, straightening a tie, but instead of a tie, it's a noose. It's a little bit like deviant art edgy. A little bit. It's a, you know? <laughs> but um, you can also see at the same time why this as his like debut work made him uh, popular in the first place. So his girlfriend who he lives with is called Brianna, which speaking of, you know, semiotics and communicating meaning, we're right back with the original film and being very on the nose in this reference to Brianna Taylor. Um, a lot of the marketing for the film, like, focused on, um, the police, and, um, it was very obvious that, like, police brutality was going to be something that was talked about in this film, but I think the way that it talks about it is very interesting. Firstly, in that, like, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's, it takes, um, it takes the position that, like, the police as a uh, white supremacist goon squad defenders of capitalism are just, that's just a basic assumption of this film. There's no questioning of police brutality. It just is, you know, but it still has an interesting conversation around that, especially with how it intersects with questions of class. Anthony's art that relates to the history of lynching has gotten uh, old news. He's no longer the hot new thing. And even though his girlfriend, Brianna, is an art gallery director. Uh, he's having trouble like making anything that excites anyone, getting any bookings, being in any exhibitions. So Anthony goes to Cabrini Green. That's kind of a tongue twister. I'm sorry if I can't say Cabrini Green again for the rest of the video. That's hard. Okay, he goes to Cabrini Green. Uh, <laughs> shit, fuck. <laughs> he goes to where the first film happened and he's doing a very similar thing to Helen Lyle. He's researching working class black culture and the Candyman myth 
in kind of exactly the same way that she did. And as he's looking around this, these now abandoned projects, he meets a character called Buck, who is a working class black guy who runs a laundromat. Buck was actually in the cold open of the film before the title sequence, as a child. What we see before the title sequence is Burke as a child in 1977 uh, going and doing his laundry. I guess laundry is just a, a big thing for him his whole life. <laughs> and uh, out of a hole in the wall comes this guy who uh, doesn't speak and he has a hook for a hand and he offers him some candy. So we're like, oh shit, it's Candyman. But when Anthony meets Burke, Burke tells him that uh, when he was a kid he saw this guy uh, and he got freaked out and his yelling alerted the police. Now the police were looking for a guy who was offering kids candy because someone had been putting razor blades in candy and uh, a, a little white girl had had one and so that's when the police started caring about it. As I say again, like, the, the film's take on the police, uncomplicated and quite based. <laughs> So in this film we have a new version of the Candyman myth. Sherman Fields, this guy with the hook hand who was giving kids candy because he was just a nice guy who liked to, liked to give kids candy, I guess that was just a thing, was killed by the police and when he was posthumously exonerated, um, he started coming back as a ghost when people say Candyman five times in a mirror he would come back and kill him. And so Anthony wants to feel connection to this story. And I say wants to rather than feels connection to this story, because this is somewhere we're going to start to diverge. So in the first film, we had two narratives going on at once. One was supernatural, and that was the one that was shown in the movie. And then there was another narrative that was going on the whole time that never gets shown. And the same is true of the, f of the new film. And I think that... The same is true of the new film, and I've seen some people who kind of take the supernatural narrative, which is also, like in the original, a fantasy, as being what the film is, and try to critique it on those terms. But actually it's a lot more interesting than that, and I hope we'll get into that now. There's this new version of the Candyman myth with Sherman, but we quickly learn from Burke that the original Candyman, Daniel Robitaille, was also the Candyman, and there have been other candy men. There have been a bunch of them. A whole bunch of guys have gotten lynched because of racism and have become the Candyman over time. So where the original had Helen being seduced by the Candyman spirit, in this one, Anthony is going to be seduced, but he's going to become Candyman instead of becoming Bride of Candyman, I guess. Also, one of the most interesting tells, and I think this is a bigger tell than anything that happens in the original, in the new Candyman, they tell the story of Helen Lyle, and they just tell you what really happened. Like, they just tell you there was this white student and she was obsessed with black people and she abducted a baby and tried to burn the baby in a bonfire and the, 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 the community wrestled the baby off her and then she threw herself into the bonfire anyway. Like, they just tell you that story and so you're like, okay, <laughs> I definitely know that what we're dealing with here is fantasy and reality, two separate things. I'm getting on too many tangents, let's carry on with the synopsis. <laughs> so... Anthony makes, again, a really edgy piece of art. It's a mirror hung in the gallery, and there's a little leaflet to tell you about it, and tell you how you have to look in the mirror and say Candyman five times, and then he'll appear and murder you. And if you look inside the mirror, um, there's a space, there's a separate room inside uh, behind the wall where Anthony's hung these paintings that he's done of just horrific violence, just like really gory, just people having been horribly murdered, and it's lit to make it even more gory. And no one's really impressed. Uh, there's an art critic who comes and looks at it, and it's just like, uh, despite Anthony kind of hand-holding her through the piece and trying to, like, really show her how, like, interesting this is, she's just like, eh, because it's, it's not that good. Brianna's art friends are unimpressed, uh, the guy who owns the gallery is unimpressed, uh, Anthony gets really drunk and yells at him and has to be escorted out by Brianna. It's all not looking good for Anthony. But then, later that day, 
the art gallery owner and his girlfriend are messing around after the exhibition is closed, and she looks in the mirror and says Candyman five times, and then Candyman shows up and horrifically murders them. <laughs> Again, a note on the visuals of the movie, I really like the way it plays with reflections throughout this, like, you only, uh, you almost entirely only see Candyman in mirrors, and so they have stuff happening in, uh, in, in, well, in, in real life, in the physical space, where, like, there's an invisible guy, basically. So you can see in the mirror that, like, a guy's got, like, hooked through his leg and is being pulled and he's trying to hold onto the door, uh, and, and Candyman is the one trying to drag him away, but in, in the foreground, in real life, like, he's just holding onto the door and he's, like, levitating, which, it's a fun special effect. I quite liked it. <laughs> what else can I say? I quite liked it. <laughs> Anthony's reaction to the news that people have been murdered in front of his art, uh, and in particular, the news, like, mentioning his name is not the healthiest reaction. He's like, they said my name. Whoa. <laughs> Where his girlfriend and I think her brother are there and they're like, this is fucked up. And he's like, they said my name on the news. Oh my God, they said my name on the news. Holy shit, they said my name on the news. And the art critic also becomes interested in him now, like now that his, his work is a big deal. So he goes to see the art critic and, um, and they have this conversation about um, gentrification and the oppression of the black community. And he's he's uh, pointing fingers at her for being a white person, valid, based. And she's saying that artists are to blame for gentrification, which is a dog shit nonsense position. But also, it's important that like fingers be pointed back at him because that is part of the conversation that the film is actually getting at. Obviously, uh, the, 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 the party to blame for gentrification is capitalism. The problem is capitalism. It's capitalism. <laughs> there are more empty homes in the US and UK than there are homeless people, and we could just put the homeless people in those homes. The issue is capitalism. The issue isn't artists, or hipsters, or avocado toast, or art critics. Right. <laughs> but it also does intersect with so many things, and class is one of them, and uh, race is one of them. And so there's this conversation between him, a middle-class black man, and her, a white woman, about who's to blame, that again, I think, taps into that original horror of how little power any one person has in any of this. While having a conversation that really resembles the conversation between Candyman 2021 and Candyman 1992. I'm getting on a tangent again, and I need to carry on with the synopsis. <laughs> okay, so there's a bunch of stuff in the art critic's apartment of Anthony looking in the mirror and seeing himself as Candyman, and uh, a bunch of, like, I think just really fun, playful stuff with reflections there. Again, visually really great. As soon as he leaves, she is murdered by Candyman. This is the part where we're really, like, slipping, sim like, similarly to with Helen, we're really slipping fully into the fantasy, and more people get murdered. Anthony goes to the hospital because he got a bee sting, but it's, like, scabbing up all over his arm. We're like, oh shit, bees, the, the hand is going, he's becoming Candyman, whoa. And he finds out through his hospital records that... He wasn't born where he thought he was, he was actually born in Cabrini Green, and he's the baby from the original movie. Whoa! <laughs> but it's important that we're slipping into the fantasy here, because I think it should be understood that he isn't the baby from the original movie. And although the scene with his mother where he finds out that he's the baby is fantastic, it didn't happen. It's all in his fantasy because he wishes that he had a personal connection to this story. Something that's really striking in this scene is that she says that she lived in Cabrini Green and then after everything that happened, she moved to a better place to, to give him a better chance and put all of that stuff behind her. And one thing that's been notable is that all the scenes in which he's been trying to come up with something to like make his art about, She's been trying to call him and he's been screening her calls. I think it's pretty clear what the film's getting at here is that, like, 
his actual mother was a working class black woman. And, and if he wanted to go and learn about working class black culture, he could have gone and interviewed her any fucking time. And it probably would have been a pretty interesting art piece and had a lot to say. And he's just like utterly unwilling to engage with it until in his fantasy, it turns out that he has this connection to the candy man. Whoa. Shit, fuck. <laughs> the synopsis. Carry on. Anthony goes off on one, he disappears. Another thing that's interesting is we keep on seeing other scenes of uh, black kids being around when like Candyman murders start happening, like two other kids. Um, and it, it, so I think that it's important to understand this is all part of Anthony's fantasy and he's imagining the myth kind of coming back to life and people spreading it around and then more murders happen because of it. The, that, that stuff isn't, I don't imagine that as being Anthony going and doing murders in high school or something. That's, that's all just purely his fantasy. Anyway, he disappears, Brianna goes looking for him, she comes to the laundromat, and Buck, the laundromat owner, abducts her and takes her to this church where he explains his evil megalomania his evil megalomaniacal fuck <laughs> he explains his evil megalomaniacal uh, plot to bring back the candy man and how he is turning Anthony into the candy man so the candy man can be back and all of this and it's like okay so it was the working class black guy the whole time he was the horror he was the evil one Anthony there's a confrontation Burke dies uh Anthony's already bleeding out when the police arrive and Brianna is cradling him in her arms, and he's, he's no threat to anyone, and still the white police officer uh, repeat, like, shoots him a ton of times, and he dies. And then Brianna is arrested, and there's this, like, over-the-top villainous monologue from the cop who's arrested her about how he's going to uh, either arrest her because she's an accomplice, or she has to sign a statement saying that um, Anthony came at them with a hook and was going to kill them and it was self-defense. And then she looks into the, like, the, the, the rear view mirror of the car that she's in and says Candyman five times and Candyman comes back in a swarm of bees and he kills all the police and she gets out of the car and she looks at Candyman and he says, tell everyone. And the film ends. So, the ending is where the film is really interesting, very complicated, and from what I've seen, lost a lot of people. <laughs> I don't necessarily mean turned them against it, I mean they lost the plot, they lost what was going on. And what's complicated about the film is that so much of Anthony's fantasy, the film is on the side of it. But it's not black and white. Like, the film isn't just saying, like, this stuff is just good, and presenting the fantasy as its narrative. It's important that it's a fantasy, and it's important that it's a self-indulgent, self-aggrandizing fantasy on the part of this black artist, but it also contains a lot of elements that are easy to agree on. That's what I've been saying the whole time about the police brutality element of the film. Like, it has a stance, and that stance is really easy to agree on, that... All cops are bad. <laughs> like, it's pretty easy to agree on that, actually. But it also plays with things in the fantasy that aren't spoken, like women constantly being silenced throughout the film. There's not only uh, Anthony's mother trying to call him, but there's also, like, Brianna, when she's trying, when she is in the laundromat and she gets locked in the back room, she's trying to get the attention of, like, another laundromat customer to let her out, and that customer can't hear her or see her, and then she gets grabbed and taken away. There's an ongoing kind of motif of women getting ignored, women getting silenced. When the cop gives his monologue at the end, the whole point is that she, she's being forced to change her testimony. Again, this is like a stance on something that we can all agree on, that like women in general, black women in very much particular, are overlooked and ignored. And tapping back into the original horror of Candyman, like, this is a systemic issue. There isn't that much that individuals can do about it, but, like, 
there are noticeable systemic impacts. For example, the complaint about, like, bread tube being too white. This is something that I've talked about before. Like, this is a, a real thing that, like, audiences have a bias because we exist in a white supremacist society. So even among, like, the lefty content creators, people are preferring to watch white people. Like, you're watching a white woman right now talk about movies about black culture in America. Like, I'm ashamed to say, but I'm British. I don't know if you knew that, knew that about me. Like, I'm not even American, <laughs> like, let alone of the cultures that these, these, these films are actually about. And, and what can be done? Well, go watch Anansi's library. She's a friend of mine and she does very good videos and you should all watch her. That's the thing I can do. There you go. But all of it keeps on tying back into this stuff. I, I think it's Brianna's uh, brother who is uh, a, a gay man and like, he's very much in their like bougie middle class existence, but it's like, well, is he to blame for any of that? I mean, a, a black gay guy, he needs, he needs safety and security, like good for him. <laughs> Uh, essentially, but like at the same time, uh, there are all these people struggling and we uh, get caught up into this like hyper reality. That's the thing that both of these films are concerning themselves with is hyper reality, is semiotics, is how culture communicates meaning and how meaning evolves over time, but how we get so caught up into it that we're ignoring normal material reality altogether. What is Burke the laundromat owner's deal like what's his life like we never find out like we hear from him about the candy man myths a couple of times in the new movie but like the scenes where he's doing an evil villain monologue that stuff isn't real that doesn't happen <laughs> he doesn't have he doesn't get to have like a master plan and and and, and revive the candy man to do something with all this stuff because he just doesn't have agency. None of these characters have agency. Nothing any of them can do can do anything. And that's what's appealing about a fantasy, right? A fantasy in which you transform into this spirit of vengeance who can, like, take out your anger on white police by being a, a, a hook-handed B-man murderer. <laughs> it's It seems to be a commentary on middle-class black people being the, the commentariat, being the voices engaged in the hyper-reality, engaged in the fantasy, engaged in the culture, where actually they aren't the same people who these issues actually concern and actually revolve around. So where does Candyman land on everything? I think that's what's probably the most interesting thing about the movies altogether, is that it just has a conversation. It doesn't actually land on anything. So even if we go back to the, the final line of the, the new Candyman, tell everyone, it feels like it's evoking the say her name parts of the Black Lives Matter protests, which uh, were getting people to acknowledge Breonna Taylor's murder. And yeah, he's saying to his girlfriend, Brianna, who uh, yeah, seemingly is named for Brianna Taylor, like he's telling her to tell everyone like we should say Breonna Taylor's name and insist that her killers are brought to justice. But this is the fantasy of this middle-class man, right? Like with the motif of black women being spoken over throughout the film, this is the fantasy of this middle-class man that he gets to be the savior of Black Lives Matter. Like why is he saying tell everyone? Like canonically in the film, what's his goal of getting her to tell everyone. Uh, I guess it's like people would have a get out of jail free card uh, against the police. They could they could say Candyman five times in the mirror and and get him to show up and kill all the cops. Then what? Like Candyman is a, a revolutionary black liberationist hero. Maybe. But again, all of this is in the fantasy of this guy, this this like uh, self-aggrandizing fantasy. Does that mean the film's stance on uh, on Black Lives Matter, on uh, police brutality, on the case of Breonna Taylor, that any of that is questioned? No, it's just in conversation where the final note that the film leaves us on gives us all of these problems to think about, but like, the solution is the solution that's kind of been presented again and again already. 
create a narrative in society, create a cultural boogeyman who can stand up and fight for people who are oppressed. But like, how much good does that do? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know, because I'm not plugged into material, the material reality of the people who are, uh, who are actually affected by these issues and able to study, like, the actual, you know, data of, like, a Candyman myth against people's oppression? Like, what effects does it have? It might have some of the int intended effects, but it also, very noticeably, is someone's self-aggrandizing fantasy. And getting out of this semiotic hyper-reality and caring about material reality is clearly the much more hands-on approach that could actually change people's lives, and I think that's a big part of the conversation that Candyman is trying to have. Like, the original Candyman, the 1992 film, could be saying, Helen Lyle, white people, just stay out. But, again, like, just staying out when when systemic injustice is being committed is not actually a complete solution. It isn't a solution of any form, really. It's agreeing with the parts that it's agreeing with, it's criticizing the parts that it's criticizing. It's a conversation. It's complicated. And I think that's what's really interesting about this movie, is that it doesn't give you as clean answers as other things would. Or another potential way you could take it, in that there are two narratives. There's the fantasy and there's the reality is that maybe there are two answers at once. Maybe in the fantasy, the fantasy answer is to promote the culture. Tell everyone. Spread the Candyman myth. Uh, get people informed through culture. Get people uh, um, on side with a narrative that could help them and, and, and to bring a community together. But the reality paints a different picture, and the, re the real world, material world answer maybe is a different one. Maybe the real material world answers that would involve just going and being involved in community organizing and doing what you can to literally fight police brutality uh, on the street, like, all of that is hard work that a character like Antony clearly isn't here for and isn't very invested in doing because it doesn't uh, get his name set on the news and it doesn't um, uh, get him recognized as a famous artist. I do think that one of the more interesting and also kind of more scathing elements of the film is how the film frames Antony as truly no different from Helen Lyle. Like, you would think that Helen, as a white person, as an outsider to the community, she is uh, more reprehensible in her fetishization of black culture, but when Antony starts to live inside his delusion, like, Helen is vindicated, like, when he goes and talks to his mother and he finds out that he was the baby, she says that Helen saved him. In his fantasy, Helen is also good. So although there was this conversation between the art critic and Anthony earlier in the film that felt very much like it's this kind of pointing fingers either way between the two films, like, Anthony's fantasy also absolves Helen, and... Helen is part of the Candyman myth. She's one of the other people who 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 uh, became unhinged, like looking into Candyman, and so is he. They're very much cut from the same cloth, and I think that's a really interesting stance that the film is taking as well. Again, are these people like evil? Are they the the ultimate villain of Candyman? No, because there's other like material oppression that's going on the whole time. And that stuff is way more directly the, the thing that's actually causing any kind of problem. But they're very unhelpful in, in pointed ways that need to be looked at. They live in their reality, and it's not plugged into the reality of the people whose issues they're concerning themselves with. And maybe, maybe in their reality, what they're doing helps people and changes things. But it doesn't in the other reality. Okay, I hope that uh, I was clear enough with all of that. Um, I know I'm describing a couple of films, and I'm not, and I, and I haven't, I know I'm describing a couple of films, and I haven't put in visuals to follow along with it. Uh, 
ideally you're watching this when you've just seen both of the films already. Please let me know if you like this kind of content, because as I said before, it makes it a lot easier for me to talk about stuff. Not just media, but also if I want to have discussions about politics, philosophy, theory stuff, it would be way easier for me to be able to just make a page of notes and then make this kind of video again and not have to write 20 pages of essay that I perform and edit and do an enormous amount on, and that would allow me to focus in a lot more on my video essay stuff and, and really make the specific stuff that I want to make and make it very, very good. And I'd really like to do that, so do let me know. I hope you like this a lot. And most importantly of all, happy Halloween! <laughs> I hope you're all having a fun and spooky time. If you want more content like this, I make regular updates that are unscripted ramble topics on my Patreon, patreon.com slash curiovids. Everyone, please remember to check out Rolling with Rainbows, my TTRPG actual play podcast, which has also got a Halloween episode coming out today, Halloween, Halloween, where we play the tabletop system, uh, Vampires Suck, brackets, at shopping. Uh, it's a very fun little what we do in the shadows esque thing, uh, where some vampires try to just complete one mundane task. Um, <laughs> the 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 full season that's going on in Rolling with Rainbows at the moment is the Call of Cthulhu campaign that I've written, um, starring my friends Jess and Joe and my beautiful partner Natalie. Other than that, I hope you all have a spooky time, and I'll see you for Resumania next month. Bye for now.